Hey, everybody. I think we're live. How's it going? I'm John Taggeary. Welcome to The Fit Show. Welcome to the Wednesday Shorts Nutrition Series. Uh, Every Wednesday, we are going to bring you a short, quick 20 or so minute conversation with somebody regarding nutrition to try to educate everybody uh, on a lot of the fallacies that people think are, uh, are what they should be doing versus what they should be doing. Today, my guest is Mr. Peter Belarchik. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, my pleasure, man. Um, Peter uh, runs a website called The Fat Adapted Athlete as well as a uh, uh, web page. And... It, uh, it is a, it, a site dedicated to how to eat in kind of a, correct me if I'm wrong, a high-fat, low-carb style diet, similar uh, yeah. to an Atkins, but more tailored for real life. Yeah, best, best, uh, best way to say it is uh, just that low-carbohydrate uh, style of performance. And it, uh, it, it, does, it doesn't always take high fat. That's uh, one of the things that we've been working on now is that there's so many of the groups out there that are geared towards the dieter that push fat, 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 eat more butter, put it in your coffee and start sucking down coconut oil. And at the end of the day, all that unused energy will still be stored as fat. Now, if you're a runner or a high performance person doing triathletes like yourself, you need that energy. I mean, that's that's what you live on. Now you just have to teach your body how to use that energy source um, in, in comparison. So uh, when, we're wor- when we're working with fat, fat is like the logs on a fire. It's very slow burning, very steady uh, compared to the carbohydrates, which are like the branches, um, you know, the kindling, the stuff that is really going to spark it up very quick. Um, a lot of people go for the wrong fuel source for the wrong job. If you're running a hundred mile ultra, you're not going to do it on sugar. You don't carry enough. Uh, right. However, however, if you're going to do an ultra and you're going to be steady and going 100 miles, you want to do it on logs. You want to do it on your own fat source because you carry uh, even the most lean person, somebody like yourself. And I've seen your recent photos. You're really leaning out well. The Thank uh, you. Uh, Even the amount of fat that you have, you still have about 40,000 calories of fat on your body that you can use. So now you just have to upregulate those pathways to teach your body that when it creates it, the energy source, which is ketones how to actually use that and uh, get that channeled up to the body to, you know, be uh, not just being wasted, uh, not just being peed out, being actually used for, for physical energy. Well, what I want to do before we really dive in is I want you to sort of give everybody a little bit of your history. Uh, sure. Tell us, so, tell us, you know, your journey into realizing how you, eat now. yeah, you know what? I, I, uh, I've always been athletic uh, from five years old. I was a martial artist. Uh, you know, I started young. I was a seven year old black belt. Uh, lived in an Aikido school for a year, and I kind of went that whole pathway over 30 years. But during that time of all this high-intensity exercise, sucking down Gatorade, you know, drinking gallons of milk, trying to do everything that possible to keep weight on, I was damaging my system. Your body can only take so much sugar overload, sugar overload, sugar overload until um, you basically you, you blunt uh, the beta cells in the pancreas. And it got to a point that when I started to do the same things I would do to diet, which was cut back calories, get into some lead food, eat a lot of rice, and uh, it just stopped working. And it started to, you know, every year it was where my bottom used to be you know, 185, then it was, you know, 205, and then it was 215, and then it started yep. to creep up. Um, and then letting things go a little bit, I jumped up to about 275 pounds. Now, I like to Ooh. think that I was able to fill it out and keep the shoulders over the top of it. And I was the king of untucked shirts. But at the end of the day, it was just a load, a load of weight. Um, We've all been there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's it's it, and, you know, also, you know, just coming from a music background, you know, there's a lot of drinking that goes on on stage and, you know, constantly pounding your body with yeah. all that alcohol, which prioritizes in the burn cycle that it has to be burnt first before it gets to everything else. Um, I did the damage. And, and you know, uh, basically, we all come with some level of metabolic damage and we create it along the ways. And for some of us, it's repairable. Uh, for others, it's way far gone where they're either type two diabetic or they get worse where they're insulin dependent. And then finally down the cycle to where they are uh, fully dependent and they can't live without that insulin. Uh, yeah, for- even a type two diabetic can be reversed most it, of the time. It can. But, you know, there, there's so much damage on blunting those beta cells uh, that 
um, you know, let's say that we repair that diabetic. And I have a lot, even my dad, 82 years old, I, I, I put him on uh, my system of how I eat. Now, he still likes a little bit of red wine. So, uh, you know, he still has to take metformin. But other than that, he's cut out all his blood pressure medicines and all his diabetes medicines. Uh, but for him, where you That's see... Awesome. When you see the normal young person that really hasn't done the damage, once we fix them, their insulin spikes will go up and then they'll blunt right back down or, or, or drop right back down. But for the person that has that damage, it'll go up and it'll, it'll linger a bit before it comes down. So there, there is some damage that's irreversible, um, you know, but through fasting, you know, there's a lot of in, in the IF world, uh, intermittent fasting that we think fixes that. Yeah. Um, but so now coming out the other side, everything that I was doing with bro science was, uh, uh, but for him, when you see, when you see the normal young, everything that I was doing by following the standard bro science way of doing things, which was, uh, you know, uh, fasted workouts and no eating after six o'clock and make sure to eat six meals a day. It all, it, it all stopped working. And, uh, until I listened to a guy, Vinny Tortorich, who was, uh, runs a show called uh, uh, No Sugar, No Grains, or a program, and he was on the Opie and Anthony show, a local uh, radio show. You probably know those guys from up in the Massachusetts area. And he started talking about um, you know, how low-carbohydrate uh, uh, works into the picture and how when you take in carbohydrates, it's just long sugars, and that creates an insulin spike which then your body has to deal with. It's a hormone. Um, in the same way, if I said, you want to get muscles, take testosterone, you'd be like, yeah, I, I don't want to, but that's, I know that's the, that's the key hormone to growing muscle. If right. I said, hey, you want to gain some fat, take insulin, you, all of a sudden, then people glaze over. And they're like, what are you talking about? But that's the key hormone, the key driver to weight gain. So if you can remove that from the picture until you can get healthy enough to get the right signaling, then you can slowly add them back in. And that's what I did. And over about six months, I dropped 65 pounds. Uh, I was doing a lot of running, um, got myself down to about 200 pounds. And then uh, for, for me, that was skinny. So now I've been for the past year on the path of trying to gain back muscle underneath this uh, the low carbohydrate lifestyle. Which is where I am at the moment as well. Um, the, the path I took, and it's funny because you and I never spoke about this before recently. Um, but the path I took was very similar because several years ago, I was 196 pounds and at a five foot six frame. That's a lot. Um, and I got down to 145 and then I got hurt a few times due to nutritionally not supporting my connective tissues. A lot of that was my supplements. Now, we, we talked, you touched on that earlier. We'll touch on that a little bit more. Um, there, there's, there's a casual nutrition need and then there's a fitness nutrition need. And I think a lot of people, when they dive into nutrition, they dive into nutrition without readjusting their nutrition needs to support the, the, the physical aspect of the working out. Um, then you get hurt and then you get disheartened and then you don't work out. And then you wind up putting on weight. Um, so this time when I came back in June, I made a very conscious effort to make sure I dialed in a supplement blend that was not only going to support my nutritional aspect of what I was doing. And so I wound up with a, you know, trying to find the right macro. Was it going to be 30, 30, 40? Was it going to be 20, 20, 20, 20, 60? And little by little, I, I found the right formula. And for me, it's been about 60% fat, 20% carb, 20% protein. But there are days where that protein set goes way higher, especially on a lifting day. Now, for me, I'm still in lean mode. Um, I've been dropping weight. So I'm at the tail end. I'm about to hit 140 next week, and that'll be 35 pounds down since June. My goal is to get down to where I'm lean, where I'm at about 8 or 10% body fat, and then take that up to 150. I knew if I went to 150 and tried to lean out, I would never do it. So I wanted to go down to where I was lean and then bring myself back up to 150 with some, with some body weight, some muscle weight, but still stay lean and still stay healthy. A big part of that is the proper macro for what you're doing. Again, if you just want to lose weight and you're just riding your bike to lose weight, there's a certain nutritional aspect you need. If you're looking to be fit and run races and do other things, there's a different nutritional need. A lot of what you do and why I wanted to talk to you today was um, a lot of what you do is very concentric and very focused on the fit aspect. So. Mm -hmm. What are, yeah. what are some of the, you know, what are some of the pitfalls when you're coming off of a 
casual fitness lifestyle into a fit lifestyle? What are some of the nutritional pitfalls that people should look out for? Yeah, and it, it's constant. You know, whenever we're working with somebody at the gym, they're usually dieting, and that means they're star starving and robbing their body of the things that they need. And if you rob your body of energy macros, and I don't consider them carbs or fat, you know, I tend to go towards fat because hormonally it just works better for me. But it, on that side of the fence, it's all, it's all devoid of nutrients. Whenever you're working on the energy side, it's energy, and it has to be treated as such. Um, you know, I, I heard it best said by Zach Bitter that – uh, who's one of the 100-mile ultra runners, the 24-hour, uh, I think he holds all the records for the 24-hour runs. He said that there is no reason for a housewife that's sitting at a desk doing bills for eight hours a day or a secretary uh, to be eating bagels. They don't need high-octane fuel. They need the right fuel for the right job. Um, right. And that's what we're trying to teach over at the Fat Adapted Athlete. And that's where a lot of like uh, nine-to-five people, they go into the office and, hey, it's so-and-so's birthday. Hey, it's this thing. Hey, it's – and hey, here's a bunch of bagels, here's some cake, here's some donuts. And they're sitting at a desk eating high-energy fuel and not moving. Yeah, yeah, and, and those, those things, you got to be responsible for each one of those energy macros. And, and on the other side of the fence is that you have your, uh, your rest, uh, you have your repair and rebuild macro, which is protein. And if you're devoid of that, not getting enough, I mean, it, it's going to be a bad day. And that's why we have injury. We have injury for, for multiple reasons. One, you're not giving your body the things that it needs to repair. The other thing is the way that we work out. And uh, for a long time, I spent a lot of time uh, using the Maffetone method, which is uh, uh, not stressing your system. It's figuring out where that heart rate is perfect um, in a zone two uh, range, which is basically uh, 180 less your age. Uh, and that puts yourself into this non-stress period where you can work out. You're using mostly fat. You're not incorporating a lot of sugar into the workout, you're not stressing and, and inflaming your whole system. And then you don't injure. Um, but what happens is, you know, you'll be running at this speed uh, at that heart rate and you'll be almost at a walk. You'll be wogging. And then after doing it for about a year, you'll be up to a run. It takes some time. So most people ignore it in the same way. Uh, you know, the pitfalls back back to the talking about the pitfalls. One of the pitfalls of my way of eating is most people don't do it long enough. They try it for a few weeks. They feel like crap. They don't get the right electrolyte balance. It is easier to eat carbohydrates and do this. But once, um, you know, through Finney and Volick, which are the gods of this industry, of what we're doing. These are the scientists that have the book, The Art and Science of Low Carbohydrate Performance, that we all go by. They also have the FASTER study, um, and that, that's Googleable, uh, which is, basically shows that fat-adapted athletes will be burning anywhere from one to one and a half grams of fat per minute, where the carbohydrate guys are only able to burn about a half a gram. Uh, right. So it's about creating those efficiencies um, but it takes almost 20 weeks to get there. Um, you know, most people will feel the benefit after eight to 12 weeks, uh, but it's so close that then they start to say, well, I'm going to incorporate a little bit more carbohydrate. And instead of going with good, slow quality carbohydrates, they're adding in faster sugars and gels and things like that. And it wrecks the process. So they never really get fully fat adapted. You were talking about blunting beta cells earlier. We actually had a question from Eric who said, how do you blunt beta cells? How does that happen? So um, what happens is when we're constantly, I, I, probably one of the best analogies that I heard is, let's say that you're in a dark room and somebody is uh, uh, flashing a flashlight in your eyes. You're never going to be able to see where the door is. But if you stop flashing that flashlight in your eyes, um, after a while, your eyes are going to adjust to the room and adjust to the amount of light there. And then you're going to start to be able to see things. In the same way, if you're constantly hitting your body with sugars and, and uh, carbohydrates, uh, your sensitivity levels change. Uh, and what winds up happening is you just you lose the ability to process uh, sugars and produce insulin the way that a normal, like a child, would, would actually do that. So what winds up happening is when, when you're eating and you get that insulin spike that goes up and raises up, now it's going to linger out there instead of coming straight back down, which is what it should do. I mean, insulin is a great thing. Insulin we use when we eat protein, we get that insulin spike. It brings the amino acids up into the mu muscle. It's very important. It protects us by pulling sugars out of the blood that is anything more than a teaspoon of sugar in the blood we can't use. Um, you know, and, and our body has to process that quick. If we don't process it quick, we're going to die. So insulin has to pull it out, put it into a fat cell to protect us. That's how... The, the processing is. So it's, it's important that it does that. But if it's doing it the wrong way or the wrong speed, um, that's, that's where we get into problems. Now, I want to ask you about, uh, I want you to explain to everybody who's watching, because I've come to where I understand it. 
but I want to make sure a lot of people do because I still get this question a lot from people, intermittent fasting. So I fast every day for 15 hours from 9 p.m. till noon. Nice. Most of it is my sleep time, which is great. I don't feel it. I don't bother with it. As soon as I'm out of bed, I start my supplement mix and I'm off to the gym. And I get a lot of people who go, well, what about breakfast? You have to have, you have, to have breakfast. You have to have breakfast. How do you go to the gym without breakfast? And it's, it's a difficult concept for them to understand that you're actually far, far better going to the gym without breakfast. Yeah, I'll tell you, breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It just shouldn't be eaten as soon as you wake up. You have to wait until you're actually hungry and you need that food. It's not automatic that I wake up, so therefore I should eat. Um, sometimes you should earn it <laughs> by doing something before you actually, or, or you should just be hungry. Uh, you know, when you're hungry, you eat. And when you're not hungry, then you stop, you, you, you don't eat. That's, that's really the process. But our signals are so screwed up that we don't know what's signaling us to eat and what's not, uh, what's signaling, signaling us to stop eating. Uh, so yeah, intermittent fasting, it happens naturally. And when people go into a uh, ketogenic style living or a paleo style or low carb, they all kind of fall into various levels of carbohydrates and what you can and can't eat or, you know, modified Atkins. Once you do that and all your hormones, correct, there's two hormones that are, are what's responsible for whether or not you're signaling to either eat or not eat. And that's leptin and ghrelin. Uh, and if those guys are functioning right, it tells you, yes, I'm hungry, eat, or no, I'm full, stop eating. But because of the way that we do things, those things are, uh, I hate to keep using the word blunted, but they're blunted. They're not giving us the right signaling. We don't hear it, and we don't hear it loudly so that we just keep eating past our, our hunger signals um, or eating past our full signals. And you know, sometimes we do that by drinking our calories. We can drink a lot of calories before we get the signal. Uh, sometimes we do it by excessive sugars. Sometimes we do it by, um, you know, in my world, by people drinking fat, you know, doing the bulletproof coffees by putting butter and cream and coconut oil on the coffee. That's the that's the rite of passage in this world, but that's really the, the, the fat passage. That's not too good. It's interesting because I, I make fun of people who are standing there with a Starbucks frappe in their hand making fun of McDonald's. <laughs> because yeah. that the cup you're holding probably has more fat and calories in it than a Big Mac all day sure. long. Sure. Yeah. You know, but to them, that's their coffee. They don't see that as a fat drink, a yeah. high sugar drink a high calorie drink, a high carbohydrate drink. They don't see it as that. A regular coffee, a black coffee is great for you actually. Even like a touch of cream or, or, or a small amount of sugar isn't gonna do you too much problem. But when you're getting one of those fraps or you're getting, um, you know, you, I'm gonna use this one and somebody who's watching this is not gonna like it. You go to Dunkin' Donuts and you get the caramel swirl. Those are high carb, high fat, high calorie drinks that are probably worse than any burger you can eat. Sure, it doesn't matter if you're drinking it or eating it. I mean, calories, calories you know, the, the thing that we've been fighting is the whole calories in, calories out, and that there's an energy formula. Um, you know, and in my world, if you talk to the one side of the group, there's a lot of, uh, of podcasters out there that are calories don't matter, you can't overeat fat, and you can do fat, 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 and that's healthy for you. And they're wrong because there's, there's multiple components. Calories do matter. Um, yep. you know, exercise, you know, growing your, your skeletal muscles so that you have a better me metabolism matters. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, hormonal balance matters. And if your hormones are out of whack because of the foods that, that, that you eat or the speed that you eat them, then, you know, that's something that needs to be addressed too. So it's, it's really there's, there's a triangle there that you got to hit. Yeah, and I think the, the, the misconception, like I always said that, you know, the Atkins diet in theory is great, but the Atkins diet to me, any diet is to, to me is bad. As soon as you put the word diet on something, because it, it, it puts it in a box that most people are comfortable with. But once the box is closed, the diet is over. There's no educational value left with you and you don't know what to do with yourself. And that's where I think a lot of those things fail. People look at intermittent fasting like, well, I, I don't want to not eat, but they don't understand how. Intermittent fasting helps clean out the body, clean out the kidneys, clean out the internals so that you have a reset. Each morning I wake up and by the time I eat my first meal, I've had a reset internally. I've had a cleaning out of some fat calories. All of the carbs are burned and my body is ready for the new supplement. My, my body is ready for the new nutrient regimen I'm going to give it that day and the, as opposed the, to still cycling through things from right. yesterday. And the newest buzzword that you're going to hear now is autophagy, and that's where your body goes back in and eats its old protein. It's kind of like tearing down the old buildings before it builds up new ones. And this that's is something, new to me. Explain that. I yeah, haven't heard it, that one yet. 
so it's it's not a new process autophagy, but last year and I, I forget the name of the Japanese scientist that kind of figured out all the pathways and what's going on. Uh, but once you stop eating, when you're fat adapted and your glycogen levels are already kind of low, and you you to, you rob yourself of nutrients um, over a 14 to 16 hour period, your body's going to start. Uh, cannibalizing itself, but it's not going to take the very rich muscles and the harder, the, the, the things that are well built, it's going to go and take all the garbage that's been kind of decaying and falling apart. Um, that's the simplest way that I can put it. It's all the old cells, the mutated things. And uh, even to the degree where there's a guy, Dr. Jason Fung, he works with very overweight people and he feels through the proper amount of fasting that you can eat up that loose skin. Uh, you know, he feels that there's a, uh, there's no reason for people to have uh, be all stretched out after they drop a lot of weight if they're if they have enough fasting. Uh, and it kind of comes down to, you know, to talk about a terrible analogy. But, you know, people that were in prison camps, you didn't see them coming out all stretched out because they were starved. They were starved. Their body ate those other parts of themselves, uh, right. the, pro that the proteins in the skin and so on and so forth, as it was just doing anything to survive by pulling in that protein. That's what happens through autophagy. Uh, on some level, you're able to pull those uh, those broken proteins back into the body and reuse them. Um, but that's only after an incredibly lengthy period of fasting. Though. Doesn't have to be lengthy after, you know, now uh, what most of them are saying, it takes two to three days uh, worth of fasting to happen, which is really not a terrible uh, thing when you're fat adapted, because once you teach your body how to how to be faster at upregulating the fat from your body into your system. You're basically feeding yourself off your body. There's no problem with that. Uh, but on the other side is when you're fat adapted, you have uh, you, you already start at uh, a little bit lower glycogen level. So once you get down to a little bit lower level, it automatically starts. So there's uh, there's talks from some of the scientists that it starts at about 16 hours. Uh, 17 hours. Uh, but it's so new that I don't think anybody's getting it right. You know, people are still unsure that if you have any nutrients, even electrolytes or water during that time, if it interrupts the cycle um, and they're kind of fighting back and forth. Uh, That's why I do it when I'm sleeping, because there's not a lot of interruption in my in my fasting cycle. And first thing in the morning is when I do my weigh ins. And then I do I go right, you know, I have my water and my pre workout and everything. But at that point, I'm, you know, deep into the fast. All right. I want to, we got to wrap this up. The, sure. The, you know, we're, we're, we're coming down on the end of here. A um, couple of quick things. Let's just talk quickly about goal setting. What are quantifiable and realistic goals that people should set? I know that you, you talked earlier about people expecting too much too soon. For me, I know when I lost the 50 pounds, I gave myself a year, 52 weeks to lose 50 pounds. I did it in about 45. This time it's been... About a pound and a half a week was, was where I was for most of this current 35-pound weight loss. And I think that was a very fair expectation was a pound and a half a week. What do you think is, is what people should expect? Yeah, from I, I mean, depending on how much fat that you have to lose, if you were a 300-pound person, you could lose about two and a half to three pounds uh, consistently week over week. When you're uh, lean, initially, initially or long term, uh, uh, long term until you get down to where you're in that 20 to 25 percent range of fat. And then it really cycles down to about a pound to a pound and a half of real okay. fat. Now, keeping in mind, a pound of fat is the size of a fist. That's that's a lot to be able to lose in in, in yeah. one week. Uh, and the rest of it is just the, the amount of food that you're either holding in your stomach, which is going to change from day to day and the amount of water that you're retaining, which is going to change from day to day. Um, you know, so when I tell people to weigh, you weigh twice a day, three times a day if you're going to weigh. Otherwise, put it away because, uh, you know, weighing is probably the worst way to tell if your body is fluctuating fat loss. It's a great way to see if your body is changing uh, weight loss uh, or weight gain. It's, right. uh, they're two different things. I do two ways a day. I weigh as soon as I'm out of bed and I, I weigh as soon as I, right before I get into bed. Because yeah, I, I like to see the change of what my day did to me versus where I am in the middle of my fast when my body is working efficiently. Yeah, it stops you and from that being gives so me, afraid. That gives, me two, that gives me two numbers to kind of go, okay, I, I go around a three to four pound swing on a daily basis. You know, midday, two meals in, or my big meal, my snack in, I'm two and a half pounds, three pounds up from where I was in the morning. I may go to bed at midnight, one o'clock, but I haven't eaten since nine. And, you know, it'll be a two and a half pound difference from when I wake up in the morning. But it gives me a good gauge of where I am. My scale is also a fat 
scale, which we all understand, you have to do a lot of different calculations to really understand your body fat. And it's never truly accurate, but at least it gives you, I, I do an upper one, I do a lower one. And then we have the pinches, of course you could do. Yeah, they're all um, indicators. It's, it's yeah. all helpful in the bigger picture of keeping score. So I think, uh, I think a realistic expectation everybody should set for themselves. If you're just an average person, I want to lose 20 pounds, a pound a week. Don't yeah. think oh, I got to lose five pounds in a week. You're not doing yourself any favors doing that. A pound a week, pound and a half at the most, that should be your goal. 20 pounds, you want to go 15 weeks, 12, 12 to 15 weeks. Lose it slowly. Um, eat correctly. Learn what's going to work for your body. Don't be afraid of fats. I think that's one takeaway we should have from your talk today. Sure. Um, anything else you want to add? Yeah, and I would say don't overdo it. You know, understand the difference of losing that pound to pound and a half a week is only about 150 to 200 calorie deficit in your, in your caloric intake each day. And when you start to do more of that, then the metabolism has to change. You know, if the factory starts getting a different amount of fuel every day, it's going to have to shift to whatever that fuel is. So if you start doing 1,500 calories a day, your body's going to get used to that. Uh, and then you're going to have trouble, you know, maintaining that. It's just not, uh, it's not something that you can keep. Real quick before we go, somebody just asked a question. James just asked a question here. It says, why are you snacking if you're trying to keep your insulin low? Yeah, for me, uh, I try to avoid snacking. I eat two meals a day. I eat lunch and dinner, and then I have a little snack in between. So this way I get an insulin rise, and then I kind of have a little spike in the middle of the day, and then I go off, and then I have my last spike of the day. And, you know, again, if insulin is up, you're, if insulin is out, glucagon can't be releasing fat from the fat cells. Those things are like sun and moon. Uh, so I try to keep insulin away so that I can release fat. I think f for me, uh, I, I think the everyday person, that's, that's a good scheme. For me, I do snack, James. I snack in between my, my, my early and my late meal. Um, but because the way I work out, I'm burning around 3,000 to 3,500 calories a day. So I do need a little extra caloric push between my meals so that I don't bonk out. Um, the way just, my body works, I'm at, I'm at about 1,450 calories just to get out of bed. And then I'm burning around another 1,500 through my workout. So I, I need a little extra caloric intake besides this, the two really big meals I eat. So that's where my snacking comes in. But they're very healthy snacks. It'll be fat snacks. It'll be nuts or some guacamole or a banana, things of that nature. I'm not sitting there eating candy bars. <laughs> Yeah, and also you're in a different category. You're training for triathletes, and your goal is not always to keep your insulin low. You're 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 actually eating to train, uh, not to diet. Uh, you're 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 not exercising. You're training. There's a completely different mindset that needs to be put in place for that. Correct. In fact, I said this morning to my wife, I need to get back in the pool. And the reason I know I, I need to get back in the pool is uh, my resting heart rate. I track my resting heart rate, and um, my resting heart rate is typically between 42 and 47. That's my normal, as low as it gets, hang around rate. And I've noticed in the last few weeks, I haven't been in the pool in a month. And in the last few weeks, my resting heart rate has creeped back up into the 50s, which is still, yeah, still you know, solid. fantastic for an old person. But that tells me that my cardio is slipping just a little bit, that my resting heart rate's coming up a little more. So that's where I'm snacking because I'm, I'm training at a level where I'm, I'm keeping a 44 heart rate. So I need a little extra calorie push during the day. This has been the Fit Show Wednesday Shorts Workout Series. Um, I want to thank Peter for coming on the show today. You're happy to be here. Uh, thank you. Peter, where can people find you? Where can they, where can they get the information that you're, that you're uh, teaching? Yeah, all platforms. So on Facebook, the Fat Adapted Athlete Group, the Fat Adapted Athlete Beginner Group, uh, where you can start. And on Instagram, the Fat Adapted Athlete. And then, of course, the website, thefatadaptedathlete.com, which is uh, under construction as we talk. Very cool. So if you just put the Fat Adapted Athlete in Google, you're going to find Peter. You're going to find come. all the sites. If you want to get some more education on a lower carb, higher fat, nutritional type lifestyle, definitely look up the Fat Adapted Athlete. Reach out to Peter. He's incredibly helpful and, uh, and he will help educate you for sure. My name is John Tagliari. This has been the Fit Show Wednesday Nutrition Shorts. See you guys next week. Thanks again, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Bye.